so I wanted to just start actually today. This is this is our opportunity to talk really just focusing on Sun's life in Mississippi and um, what what that was like. Not not necessarily thinking as much about his music, but really about his life and and the context of that world that he was living in. And so we're talking about 1902 to 19 or thereabouts to 1943 when he moved to Rochester and. I guess um, my history knowledge of Mississippi is maybe not as broad as it should be, but I um, I know that Mississippi was uh, the second state, I believe, to secede from the Union during the Civil War. So going back just before, you know, before Son's birth, um, and was one of the last states to enter back into Reconstruction, um, even though uh, there were, you know, the majority of the state was uh, populated by African Americans. Um, you know, of course, the power um, was held by the landowners, the white plantation owners, um, which meant that uh, after the Civil War, they were the um, <laughs> ever, the state was resistant to letting go of slavery. Right, and so that's how the sharecropping system came about, right? Am I, is there anything, help me, yeah. <laughs> is that, does yeah. that feel yeah. like the right, the, the yeah. right sort yeah. of broad sweep of it? Was word. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So in the sharecropping system um, was, was really, um, uh, talk about that a little bit, if one of you could, about what, you know, the, certainly, you know, the African Americans were farming the land they were living in um, tiny little homes, right? And, and in fact, a lot of times ended up owing a lot of money to the farmers for whom they were working. Right, they weren't paid by the hour or any kind of wage, but it, they, the reason they called it sharecropping was because they would supposedly share the profits with the, they would, they would raise the crops and the plantation owner would uh, furnish the seed and a place for them to live. But they would have, at the end of the year, um, the plantation owner would, they would gin the cotton and they would weigh it and how much, and find out how much each sharecropper had earned. And uh, if he hadn't. Yeah, that might not have turned out. Okay. Okay, at the end, no. sharecropping, can you hear me now? Uh, speak right into it, if you would. Hello? No. 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 Here, let's hand you mine. Let's hand you this one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, the system was that the, uh, is that better? Okay. Okay, uh, the system was that the, the sharecropper that would uh, split the profits from raising the cotton with the plantation owner and the, the plantation owner would, would furnish them some money to live on in the meantime, give them advances so they could have some food and supplies. And, uh, but at the end of the year, when the, uh, they would weigh the cotton and calculate how much money had been made, and of course that, the calculations were all in the plantation owner or his employees charged so they could adjust the figures however they needed to. And often, the amount of money earned, the half of the amount of money earned wasn't as much as had been advanced to, for the year. So at the end of the year, the sharecropper would still be in debt. And if they tried to move, there was, the plantation didn't honor, didn't want them to move because they owed him money. So they were trying to keep them in place. So in, in, in a sense, it was a perpetuation of, of some of the same parts of slavery. So, uh, so that's the world that Sun House is born into. And uh, this morning, we were talking about, it, you mentioned um, the sort of the controversy over Sun's birth date. And then John Mooney referenced it as well. So what, um, what do we know for sure, or do we know anything for sure <laughs> about where and when Sun was born? Uh, when I wrote the text for the the marker that's going to be un unveiled tomorrow about Sun House. I sent the text to Dan, and the only point he had to make was about the birth date, because there, 
There is a one, a, one official birth date, which is 1902, but there's other documents and other uh, statements by Sunhouse that they're, say they're much, that he was born earlier than that. Yeah, I, I'm convinced the 1902 date is right um, for various reasons. It's on the census. The first census he's mentioned, in I, I think it was the 1931. And it's what he told Alan Lomax in 41. And he had no reason to misrepresent it to Alan Lomax for any reason, you know. And if you get rid of that date, then the chronology of his, especially of his youth and everything, it just falls apart. I mean, it's, it throws everything into confusion. If you keep it, the, the dates of his, so you know, being a preacher, leaving the pulpit, taking up blues, being convicted of probably manslaughter, sent to Parchman, getting out, it all, it hangs together in a way. If you reject that, you have hash. <laughs> and, you know, as a biographer, it was like this, you've got to settle on something. But he, he you know, he, there, there were a lot of things in his, Besides the birth date, there were a lot of things about his early life that in the interviews that were done in the 60s conflicted. He told interviewer A this. He told interviewer B something different. A lot of those people, most of those people were just young white blues fans. They were not like journalists and, and people who approached an interview in a kind of professional way. It was like, you know, son, I, I only want you to tell me about Robert Johnson. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in anything else. And they didn't cross-check what had already been published. They didn't say, well, you told interviewer A, you know, 1927 on this is when you, you know, went to prison or something like this, which it could be. And, but you told this guy it was 1928. They didn't do any of that. They didn't read each other's work. And so you have a mass of conflicting facts. And it was Sunhouse, you gotta remember, this is him, a sole survivor at this point, 40 plus years after the fact, at least. There's no one around, he has no siblings who survived with him, friends, you know, no, there was no one around who knew him before 1930 at that point. And so he had no one to say, you know, to correct his memories. And I know from my own childhood, things that like were, or, you know, when you're really small, you construct some account of something in your childhood. And then like, you know, your older sister years later says, that's not right. <laughs> you know, right. that didn't happen in that year. And you go like, oh, well, you know, he had no one to do that for right. him. So I think, oh, too. It's pretty, is, it's pretty well certain to be the date, yeah. Becca, can you show the SS5 slide? Yeah, 1902 does make more, definitely more sense in the chronology of events for Sunhouse's life. But at times, this, this is the social security <laughs> application he filled out in 1943. And you see his birth date is 21st of March, Wednesday, 1894, it looks like. Of so course, <laughs> there he might have had a reason to move, bump it back. <laughs> right, right. To make himself older and eligible. Right. Right. This was during World War II, you remember. Uh, but in the census of 1940, uh, he claimed to be 45. So there's another. <laughs> and, and is Dick Waterman here? Yeah. Right how, many, no, how many birth dates did Sonny Boy Williamson have? Not, you know? Yeah, not as many as Mississippi John Hurt, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I found eight, actually. Eight, eight different birth dates for Mississippi John Hurt. Eight. Yeah. Um, but uh, Dick Waterman was always convinced the son was older because um, the statements he had made, you know, he claimed he was married and working in, East, in St. Louis during World War I and that he was uh, 79 at some point, in, uh, which would have made him born in 1886 by Dick's calculations, but um, that seems to be way 
too old, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, too, the number of marriages is another issue. When he talks, I mean, one of the things you, you find out when you start really getting into su a subject like this, when he talked about being married five times, he didn't get married in front of a judge, a justice of the peace, five times. He means maybe like five times he set up housekeeping <laughs> arrangements. He doesn't, the only marriage certificate I've ever seen was to Evie. It's from 1934. I saw it in the courthouse at Tunica. Do you have that, there Becca? Can you show that? It's right there. And, and, um, yeah, E.J. House Jr. was how he used it, you know, signed his name there. Right. Yeah. Eddie James House. So, I noticed one of the interesting things, I don't know if you noticed this, Dan, the, uh, the person who married him was Reverend Henry Berry. Yeah. <laughs> That turns out, I, I researched him in the census, and there was, um, among the artists that Alan Lomax recorded in 1941, uh -huh. along with Muddy Waters and, and Sun House, was Charles Berry, who was on the same plantation as Muddy was. He was a singer and guitar player. Uh, so he was a friend of Muddy's, and Muddy had actually married Mabel Berry, who was his sister. Okay. So that shows how close that yeah. Sun House Muddy Water Circle was. You know, when, I went, when I went in the courthouse, my sort of due diligence trip down there to make sure, mm -hmm. okay, let's search for whatever there is in you know, the records. When I walked in that courthouse, they, op they had the book opened. They had a little red flag on it, and they put it open, and it was to Robert Johnson's. <laughs> they just assumed that that yeah. was what I was coming <laughs> right. there for. Right. And I said, no, I'm actually interested in this guy named Eddie Sun House. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, I did not know that about <laughs> Reverend Her Henry Berry. But my, my original intention was to step chronologically through Son's life, but we've just sort of jumped forward to his <laughs> marriage. But that's okay. So we'll, we'll kind of back, back up a little bit. And just, um, you were talking about Son as have, um, look, there's Son and Evie. Um, you were talking about Son as being the sole survivor. Mm -hmm. How, he, but he had brothers and sisters, he did. right? What was his family life like? He was, he had two brothers at least. Um, I'm trying to like, <laughs> like Lee, I have Lee to Jackson, look in my own yeah, book. Lee Jackson House Lee, and, and Rothell. Yeah, that's it. And Rothell's last name was Price for some reason. Yeah. Found out um, he, he came from a musical family. His father had like, God, I don't know, a large number of brothers. He had many uncles, and they all played something. His father, he said he played bass. He meant a tuba. And his uncles and his dad played in a brass band. His dad had a guitar, and he was a blacksmith on the plantation near Clarksdale. And he remembered his dad playing the guitar when he was really small, his dad playing, and he said he played a thing called Four O'Clock Blues, which is the name for many blues songs, like, been recorded. There's, I don't know how many versions of something called Four O'Clock Blues. His parents split up early. Um, he was small, and he went with his mom. Um, she was in the church. His dad was not initially, but he said later his dad kind of went straight and got back in the church. Um, his mom took him down to live in Algiers, which is now basically part of New Orleans. He worked, you know, I mean, it was the story of a, of a young black man, boy, Van, in Mississippi and Louisiana, where you started to work as soon as you were capable of doing something. He remembered like pulling Spanish moss off of trees for stuffing pillows, this kind of thing. Then they moved back to the Delta, and you know, he was in the church with his mom, he was working in the fields, and he you know, the, and he like is he got now we're talking like probably he's ten or something like this, eleven, twelve years old. He's you know he's on the verge of adolescence. He um, he wanted to he very much wanted to be a preacher at that point, and he knew that you know the main qualification for it was to say you had gotten religion, <laughs> which. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's funny, you know, some of the, the things that are, have been written about him, you know, about this anguished relationship with, with religion and things. I actually, especially the Jeff Todd Titan interview, which was done in Living Blues, mm -hmm. published, one of the, main, the two main sources for the real chronology there, there, as he recalls these things about his youth, getting religion for one thing and beginning to preach when he was in his teens, not like he was the preacher, but just being allowed to step into the pulpit, you know, and say something. He recalled it with a kind of, there was some comic quality about it, him recalling it. It wasn't like some anguish thing to him all. He was like laughing about some of it, you know. He's like getting religion he was laughing about. Like, what is it, you know? And so the, even from from uh, the beginning, when before he before he did become a preacher and was sort of the preacher of a of a church, mm -hmm. um, he he was uh, not necessarily taking it seriously. He was well. I think as a youth he was. Yeah. But when he recalled it all years after the fact, I think he saw it in a kind of comic, partly in a comic light that this was, you know, he walked away from it. <laughs> I mean, after all. Right. And I think he just saw it as sort of a, in some respects, he saw it as some of it as a youthful folly, you know? Interesting. He just it was like, you know, I got religion. I was out in an alfalfa field and like, and, and it was like, in the book, I think I compared it to like somebody who's really young trying to figure out what sex is. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's really big and it's really important but what is it? And it was like, and before he got religion, I think it was kind of the same thing. It was like, everybody's talking about it all the time, but you know, right. what is it? Right. And then he got it, so to speak, and he started preaching. And, um, you know, and from there, he, he was obviously a very intelligent person, and he was literate. And he had his Bible together, and by you know his early twenties, he was able to step out of the alfalfa field and preach, and which was a huge thing financially. Was was he <laughs> moving around? I mean, was he an itinerant preacher or? Um, well, he moved. You know, that's another thing that's kind of, I kind of, I sort of, how would I say it? Elided some of those difficulties <laughs> in the book. He did move around a bit as a preacher, more as a laborer. Um, and it seems that he kind of alternated between those two things. He, you know, he talked about himself. Uh, the chapter is called, I think it was Ramblified. He had, he had a great way with language. It was really colorful. And um, talking about, like, as you say, working in St. Louis in a steel mill for a while and bouncing around that way. Also as a preacher, he certainly was a preacher at a church near Clarksdale for a while, because that was the incident that led to, you know, it was in the reading of the play the other day of him running off with a member of the congregation to Louisiana, which was, you know, kind of the end of that job, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> if, you, if you ran away with somebody in the congregation, you know, it was sort of like, not. You were kicked out. Well, it was kind of <laughs> frowned on, I think. <laughs> and she, her dad was there. And um, again, the two main interviews that really formed the, you know, the backbone of the whole narrative in that part of the, his life, Julius Lester and Sing Out and the Jeff Todd Titan one. Um, they lived for a while with her dad in North Louisiana on his farm. And he came to suspect that that was just like, you know, why she had hooked up with him. She wanted him, like, I think her name was Carrie Martin or something like that. That right. she wanted, you know, her dad needed a laborer. And he, he, he was, the, you know, as far as being kind of bitter about things in his life, that was one thing he, whenever he spoke of her, he was bitter about, even years later, that she'd somehow taken advantage of him. And he said, you know, something like, I left her dad, I left her dad hanging on the gate, saying, come back and plow. And he was like, no thanks. <laughs> and he went back to preaching, and then, you know, but he had, even before he started playing the blues, he was having trouble 
staying in the pulpit for because of drinking and womanizing. Okay. You mentioned what a financial advantage it was to become a preacher. And, uh, Muddy Waters, uh, when I interviewed him once, he said that you know if you were uh, if you were like basically a plantation worker in the Delta, if you, and you wanted to better yourself, if you wanted to. So, you know, some kind of occupation that would be profitable, that it would get you out of the fields, you know, make some money. You had three choices. You could be a blues singer, a preacher, or a baseball player. And he said he couldn't preach and he hurt his finger, so he became a blues finger, blues singer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, in Sun House's day, it was even, I mean, that when I came to try to explain how he took up blues, it was really like there was a triangle. You could do menial labor, there was a preacher, and since sometime after 1900, probably, there were professional blues singers who were rivals to the preachers. Right, I mean, this definitely. is, you know, the moniker, the devil's music, it didn't only have to do with where it was played and the kind of people who played it and listened to it. It had to do, in part, and this is not my original insight, this is, you know, people writing long ago, but, um, it had it, Lawrence Levine, black culture, black consciousness. Um, the blues singer was a rival to the preacher. He delivered an experience that was comparable in a way, except it was on Saturday night. But right. he gave you an emotional experience that could rival what the preacher was giving you on Sunday. And the preacher saw them as rivals, as people who were drawing away from them and for house you know when i tried to explain i mean how could this guy who grew up thinking you know he said he was so churchified that he couldn't stand the sight of a man with a guitar and then all of a sudden he's that man right well how'd that happen right there's like he was in a there were three places to be either like sharecropping or the levy gang or whatever the preacher and the blues man. He would tried to. Well, what's left? All right. Can can we talk for a minute about the you know this the dichotomy of the sort of blues and um, and spiritual and you know blues and and the devil and um, church and religion and God being being so such um, separate. Um, I, I think we, as we've started, as when we first started talking about this, we, we had a lot of response from people saying that that's not how it's really seen, certainly now, um, in the African American communities. And I guess, do you think that that dichotomy really sort of comes from that, that rivalry between the blues man and, and the preacher? I think there's a there's a lot to that, and then, you know, that, you know that's a good point because that's not usually the point that's discussed. It's usually thought of in spiritual terms, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the devil and the evil versus the Lord and the and the gospel music. But it, but it was there was a very practical side to it, you know, and I think someone like Charlie Patton was probably able to play both sides of it better than Sun House was for some, you know. <laughs> Charlie Patton could preach and, and continue to play the blues and he recorded both kinds of music. Yeah. Know? He was a different kind of a character yeah, definitely. for sure. Yeah. He didn't <laughs> use mercurial, you yeah. know. But, uh, you know, I think it's a spectrum. It isn't necessarily this black and white dichotomy, but it's still there. I mean, Joe Beard, <laughs> you know, he's like somebody, one of the times he was in my History of the Blues class talking about his musical career, one of the students in the class, this is some years ago, he said something, have you ever heard the term devils, the devil's music? And he said, of course. And, he was like, <laughs> and he's like, well, it was just some preacher told me I was doing that. And he says, he just wants me to come and play for free in church. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and like, but, you know, it's, it's not simply the blues. I mean, People who were really into the church, the black church, who were really into it, like Sissy Houston talked about the flack she took, Whitney Houston's mom, right? The Sweet Inspirations was right. right? Mm -hmm. The flack she took for being in that, you know, secular vocal group with Atlantic from people who were like, you're not supposed to use your voice for anything except spiritual music. 
And she said she took a lot of flack for it. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's not just the blues. It's, right. you know, but I mean, but again, there's, then there's the people who went to the juke joint on Saturday night and went to church on Sunday morning. Right. You know, and didn't feel like it was. Right. Yeah. And when Sam Cook, who was from Clarksdale, when he crossed over from being a gospel singer with the Soul Stirs to, to being a pop star, you know, not just a, not not a blues singer so much as being a, a real pop star. You know, he crossed all the way over, and there was just a huge controversy. You know, you read the black newspapers of the time. You yeah. know, and, uh, he added an E to his name. To right. Try, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To try he, to he added, trick people. Right. He added an E to his name, and he made made one record as Dale Cook, so that people wouldn't know who he was. Wow. Um, but but the uh, that dichotomy. I mean the. Uh, the devil's music theory is that's still they're very prevalent in a lot of churches. Yeah. I know in Clarksdale, where um, we have the uh, Sunflower River Blues Festival, it became the Blues and Gospel Festival, but the gospel singers wouldn't sing on the same day as the blues singers. You know, you know they they'll they'll come that close to it, but they can't mix. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk for a minute about Clarksdale and um, Jim. You lived in Clarksdale for a while, right? When how, when yeah. did you live in Clarksdale? I lived there for ten years, from 1988 to 98, and then lived in the Delta in Oxford a little bit before that. Okay, and we can assume that between 1943 and 1988, there's several changes have happened in the area. But can you talk a little bit? What's the what is Clarksdale and that sort of surrounding area? Because Son really. All of, all of the little towns that he was living in were really kind of clustered around Clarksdale, right? They're not too far from the Clarksdale area. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about sort of what that that is, the area is like, what the culture is like in that um, in that area? Well, Clarksdale was once, not once known as the golden buckle on the cotton belt, and it was the one of the center, one of the two main cotton centers uh, off the Delta is uh, Clarksdale and Greenwood, and so that's where all the surrounding plantations would uh, they would do a lot of their commerce either in Clarksdale or Greenwood or, or Memphis. A lot of people had offices in Memphis, but that also brought a lot of plantation workers to Clarksdale on Saturday night, so that became a big blues center. Uh, and there was, um, when Alan Lomax was there, you know, he was 1941 and 42, you know, he wrote about the resistance he encountered in Clarksdale from the sheriff and in, in Tunica County, the next county up where Sun House lived. And uh, so that kind of attitude kind of lasted for a while. And, and Clarksdale wasn't, even though it was, it became known as the, the greatest blues town in the Delta, uh, a lot of it had to take place outside of town because Clarksdale, as some of the blues singers said, they rolled up the sidewalks at 12 o'clock. And if you were, especially if you were black and you were on the street after 12 o'clock, you could get arrested. You right. know? Yeah. Can we talk about some about the jukes and what what was what was it? What were the juke joints like? What was that? You know, really kind of. Paint us a picture of, of the jukes. Right, we think of jukes, juke joints as being places in town and uh, in the city, and there were, uh, of course, a lot of them in every Delta town. You know, across the tracks, they're, they're, each town had its own black section, which was across the tracks from the, the railroad tracks from the from the white section, and especially on Saturday night, uh, I've heard so many stories of, of people, even the smallest towns that. They would be so packed that you could hardly walk down the sidewalk. You'd have Big Jack Johnson, who lived in Clarksdale, said you have to turn sideways to get down to Sequina Avenue. And uh, so that, that was packed, but actually there was more taking place outside of town because they, they had the after hours and they were also less subject to being policed. And uh, they were, so there were these places on the plantations. And uh, I met uh, Evie House's uh, niece, actually, I think she called herself her, her niece-in-law or something, but she lived in Robinsonville, and she remembered, you know, she knew uh, Sun House and Willie Brown and some of those artists, and she said uh, they mostly played at people's houses. So the original juke joint was someone's house. It wasn't a bar, or saloon, or club. 
it was uh, someone's house where they would clear out the furniture and make room for dancing and gambling and uh, selling liquor and uh, fish, fish or sandwiches or whatever. And uh, they would just go, go on and on. And there, there was very little law enforcement involved, you know. <laughs> Right. In, in the play, if you were at the reading of the play last night, um, one of the characters says, you know, is talking about the jukes and, and what happens in the juke joints and said, you know, one guy would, would stab someone else in the hand for the last chicken wing. Um, so what do you do you think that um, I mean, was it dangerous? Were the juke joints sort of a dangerous place? Were they? Is there, <laughs> thank you, Dan. Can answer, <laughs> give us some stories about that. Well, I mean, that was something that not only Sun House, but other people like David Honeyboy Edwards talked about. Just the thing about the Delta especially was that there was the law were the planters, the wealthy planters. The sheriffs just did whatever they wanted them to do. And that, like in some cases that worked, like for Sun House, that worked out. I'm almost certain like the planter, he said that his family, his dad and then his cousins, whatever, they all, the planter they worked on, his plant, whose plantation they worked on, regarded them as good people, good workers. And he, almost certainly, he was the guy who went to the judge in Clarksdale and told him, would you release Eddie Sun House? So that they could, but there was another side to that. He, as he said, and, Honey Boy Edward said this in the biography that's been made out of all the interviews he did, which is brilliant because it's not, it reads like a real autobiography. It's a great work. The World Don't Owe Me Nothing. Mm -hmm. That's like highly recommended for its portrait of life in Mississippi at that point. And he said like everybody knew that if you were a good worker, you could get away with killing somebody. Everyone knew it that the planter would just come down to the jail and say, let him out, he's a good worker. So that when disputes arose, and everybody was armed, you know, knives and pistols. And he, son described one instance when he and Willie Brown were playing, and he, but he, the way he described it, you could tell that it wasn't like the only time it ever happened. They're playing, and a guy whose name he had a nickname, Horse, I think it was. I, think, I don't think the killer was Horse. But this guy walks in and he says, where's Horse? And the guy was like, just sitting on the floor, leaning against the wall. And he just walked over and shot him. Like, <laughs> and walked out. And the way Sun House described it, you could tell that it wasn't probably the only time he ever saw something like that happen, you know? Right. That he, because he talked about like, it's interesting, the pistols that were used, he said they'd file the sights off and they called them lemon squeezers. And, you know, he's like everybody was armed and knew that you could get away with almost anything like that. So, you know, it was just, it was a place without law, essentially. Right. You know. So, so this brings us kind of to um, Sun's time in Parchman, which w was, you know, happened because of something that happened at a juke joint. And the story is a little confusing. <laughs> yeah. He, um, he was at a house party. It was a Saturday night. And the, a fight, he, according to his own account, he was out on the porch and somebody got into a fight inside and I think they shot his uncle again I would have to go and read my own book again um, he climbed in through the window and shot the guy and he being son son the window was broken and one of the bullets it, he was with his uncle on the porch as he put it I think and the uncle's ankle was broken if I remember it, so it was. and then he climbs in through the window and he shot the guy his name, uh, it's in the book, Lee somebody. Lee or Lee. Yeah. And um, so the next morning, he had a girlfriend named Cornelius. Okay. <laughs> this is, Mississippi was a different place. There's a, guy, there's a guy in the book, Rennis Glisson, whose wife was named Doug. And um, he, the next morning, the sheriff picked her up, and she was wearing some of House's clothing. 
and she testified against him, which as I say was probably marked the end of their romance. And he got sent up, sent off to prison on, the, you know, I mean, he claimed self-defense, but he was sent to prison. And like, again, as I say, there were no records for anything like this. Right. There, I, when I asked at courthouses for things like that, they were just like, are you kidding? Yeah, um, I don't think those records have ever turned up. I know people have tried to get them from Parchment. And they didn't keep records, yeah. you know. It was like, it, well, I mean, it was Jim Crow South. You know, they were, these weren't regarded as like full-fledged humans, citizens. So why would you keep records? You just dealt with well, them, you know. The, uh, did you say this morning that birth certificates weren't kept in Mississippi until 1912? 1912, right. So, I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> that, but that's, you know, it, we, we've always said that the black people didn't need birth certificates. You know, that, that was what the... the the saying has been, but it was everybody actually. You know, they weren't required in Mississippi until 1912. <laughs> Mississippi is different. <laughs> yeah. you know. So let's let's talk about Parchman for a minute. Parchman was sort of a profit center for the state of Mississippi, a prison that was a profit center. Um, and uh, can can one of you talk a little bit about Parchman and what it's how it became a profit center and what it what it was really doing and what life there might have been like well it, yeah it was notorious because they you know the uh, plant the prison laborers would be hired out um, you know to various plantation owners or or whoever wanted some labor and uh, they basically had free labor and could you know, build things raise crops whatever was right. needed did the did prisoners at Parchman also did they have any, um, like they cleared the land around the prison as well, right? So right. they, and were they, they were farming, because it's called Parchman Prison Farm. Right. Right, so, so were, was that farm creating some of the profit as well? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, there was that. Uh, but one thing is, you know, whether Sun was, Sun made a record called Mississippi County Farm, and that's, and, and the and the uh, the recording that's when he sings about uh, Leroy Lee in yeah. that case, but Mar Parchman wasn't a county farm. Was Parchman a was a state prison, so there's a possibility that he wasn't really in Parchman, but in in prison in anyone. Coahoma County in Clarksdale. Yeah. I think he was on the, in Coahoma County on the county farm for a while, and it might have had to do something with like I don't know a lesser offense. But um, you know, we we'll put you to Captain Jack and all that stuff. All right. What's Captain Jack? Well, that's in the song Mississippi County Farm Blues. It's when he retooled it, you know, it, for Alan Lomax. Um, he there the lyrics refer to this guy, who, and he talked about him in an interview. I think it was the interview he did with John Fahey about there was this guy. He was a white boss gang you know, chain gang boss, and his name was, they called him Captain Jack, and son talked about how you had to say everything like, yes, Captain, good morning, Captain, or you paid a physical price. And um, so I think he was on a county farm, prison farm, as well as Parchman, but he didn't say what he was there for, you know, I mean, as I say, people didn't, you know, they didn't. They didn't always ask the right questions. <laughs> you know, that I wanted them to ask many years after the fact. I don't think they were all reading each other's stuff, like you said. They yeah. Did. But they, it was harder, much harder back then to keep up with that. Who, you know. Yeah. Because they, something might have been published in uh, some the obscure local, little journal, like the Broadside in Boston or something, right. and uh, something else in a. In, in a folk journal, or right? Something. So it was harder to find. I, I was saying to somebody before, you know, it was just like at that point, it was hard to find out information. Even just like you know, when you found out, oh, like oh, McKinley Morganfield, that's this guy named Muddy Waters. You, you didn't just go to the regular place you bought a rock and roll album and get a Muddy Waters album. Mm -hmm. You had to like search around, and that was stuff that was current. Let alone things that happened or were recorded right. you know, back. Right. So it was a different time. 
So Sun, Sun gets out of parchment because the, a plantation owner Probably, comes and says, yeah. please release this man. Yeah. Um, and the judge says, okay, but on, on the condition that you never come back to Clarksdale, <laughs> yeah. right? And so uh, Sun goes how far away? <laughs> well, not very far, which tells you a lot about the Delta then. Because he didn't, he just got on, he jumped on a, you know, a freight train. And he went, it's, I think Lulu's 17 miles north. Does that sound about right? Yeah, about. Mm -hmm. I, I've been there several times. You know, it's a huge metropolis, obviously. <laughs> he gets off, but he only goes 17 miles. It's not like he had to, he left the state or anything. And it's curious that, you know, and this is something that only really occurred to me this month in talking to some people about the whole story. But if he hadn't gone to prison, his whole career would have probably been slightly, somewhat, well, different. He would have ne probably never recorded in 30. The judge tells him, get out of town. I never want to see your face again. He goes, I don't know why he chose Lula. No one ever asked him, why did you go to Lula instead of wherever, you know? He goes there. By chance, Charlie Patton has set up shop there. He's operating out of Lula. He was off Dockery's, and, which is down south, and he's on, in Lula, where, <laughs> and they hadn't had a blues man in Lula, according to the Patton biography, since 1918. So this is 1930, when Rennes Glisson was hauled away in shackles for cutting off his wife Doug's head. <laughs> Just say that about her before. <laughs> his friend who played with him, Willie Moore, said he had a wife named Doug and he cut her head off and they put him on parchment for life. So maybe House ran into Glisten at parchment and he told him there's an opening or something. <laughs> but he goes to Lula, he gets off the train, he does what any blues man would do. He starts playing for tips and Charlie Patton is standing across the street watching him and Within a day or so, Patton's approached him, and they start to become friends. And they hung around. You know, I don't want to say that this stuff happened in early 1930, and then they hung around in late winter and early spring, and probably recorded in late spring or summer. But Patton then, Lemon Jefferson had died the year before, who had been one of the biggest male artists for Paramount Records. That left Patton as the main man for Paramount Records. And Art Labley came through Lula, <laughs> you know, got off the train while it was just stopped for a few minutes. And he'd sent word to Patton that I'm coming to talk to you. He was on his way to Texas to try to find a replacement for Lemon Jefferson. And he said, we want you to come back into the studio and you've got, basically gave him carte blanche to bring anybody he thought was worth recording with him. And that was the break for Sunhouse. Yeah. He said, he brought Sunhouse with him and that led to Sunhouse meeting Willie Brown. Willie Brown was living up north, Robinsonville area even then. And there was a girlfriend of Patton's up there, Louise Johnson, who was a barrel house piano player. And he picked, they, he and Sunhouse, they hired a sanctified teetotaler named Wheeler Ford. What a great name to be a driver, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, to drive them. They picked up Willie Brown, whom this is the first time Sunhouse meets him. And, but Willie Brown and Patton had known each other since before 1920. You know, Patton had schooled Willie Brown in a lot of ways. And Louise Johnson, who was, one of Patton's girlfriends on the side, and they go off to Grafton. And that was like how Sunhouse ended up on record. But it, it was just sort of like, I don't know if he knew Patton was there or somebody told him, I don't know. But it was, if not, it was just an extraordinary coincidence that he ends up there and this guy says, he's out of prison. And the next thing he knows, he's got a recording contract. <laughs> He, yeah. you know, it was like a huge break for him. What could have been a break, right. except for you know the depression and everything. Right. So when does he meet Evie? Or where? I guess well, maybe. after Grafton, they went back to Lula for a little while. I would say probably only a few months. He and and Charlie Patton, and then in the course of that trip, 
he and Willie Brown, Patton and Willie Brown, as Sunhouse said, he had really colorful expressions for some of these things. They had almost had a fist fight on the way up to Grafton. He said that they didn't set horses, meaning they, they squabbled a lot. But Sun and Willie Brown got along great. They became, Willie Brown became his best friend he ever had. He said, we were closer than brothers. So after a few more months in Lula, Patton went back down south. So this is like probably late 1930. And Sun House moved up to the Robinsonville area where Willie Brown was. And he and Willie Brown became inseparable partners as far as musically playing together. And that was really important for Sun House's musical development because prior to that, I don't believe he knew how to play in anything but what they called Spanish tuning, open G. Willie Brown taught him how to play in standard tuning, which greatly increased his repertoire. And then the two of them, you know, played together the rest of the 30s. He must have met Evy there, oh, I want to say, oh, well, they got married in 34, but it was sometime in that interval, probably 31 through 32 or 3, something yeah. like that. Um, the woman that I subsequently met after the book came out, Casella Knox, who knew him from in Robinsonville from 1930 on, you know, I, she, what she told me led me to believe it was probably around 1932 or so he met Evie. And then they married the same year that Charlie Patton died, 34, which, at which point he and Willie Brown became the biggest names in the Delta and the Blues. What do we know about between then and 1941, when Alan Lomax reports him for the first time. There's not much documentation, though. No. <clears throat> but I think he was mostly around Robinsonville because he's well remembered, and he, and I talked to people who remembered him from different plantations in right around Robinsonville. Uh, one of them was the Harbert Plantation. Do you have the slide of uh, the Hollywood Cafe? Oh yeah. The the. There was a plantation called, run by uh, Frank Harbert uh, in Robinsonville, and, and each plantation had a commissary, which is the store where the, the hand, field hands could shop, and, and uh, they would have to use, you know, in the early days, they would have to use the uh, plantation script or token. They couldn't use Right. It was, uh, they were paid with, with uh, essentially private currency that could only be spent at the plantation commissary. So the plantation owner not only could control their, what money he gave them, but, the, but how they were, could spend it. Uh, did you find that, uh, Becca? That and slide? so then, then they would also earn that money back. Right, by if, if they are if they own the commissary, then the right. plantation owner right. is right. the earning he, all the, he, their money back. Right. Yeah. So it goes around in a circle. He all, and all the Casella remembered that whole era pretty well, and he and Willie Brown, he remember she remembered them playing every Saturday night at a juke joint. Yeah. And she remembered Willie Brown. He was married and had a daughter. He was a small guy, and he didn't. He wanted to be the second, and the, but they played every night, every Saturday night, and then they, by the end, this was the, the period was the agriculture in the Delta was changing, it was becoming mechanized. And by the end of the, you know, what we know is that by the end of the decade, he was driving a tractor. Right. And, and that was it, he, but he played in the, and he had girlfriends. And Casella <laughs> knew most of them, I think. <laughs> and she might have been one. So the Hollywood Cafe, by the way, um, was the was the first stop with, when we first started planning this? It was the first stop that Skip Greer and I made in Mississippi as we were doing our research. Was the Hollywood Cafe, and they have the best fried pickles I've ever tasted. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But there's talk a little bit about the Hollywood Cafe, a little bit more about that history. Right. So after it was the this this building still stands in Robinsonville. Most of most of what was beautiful downtown Robinsonville is gone. Um, <laughs> It was got torn down, and then most of the property got bought by the casinos that are in, in Tunica. But uh, the Harvard, play, Harvard Commissary was still standing, and it uh, became the Hollywood Cafe. Uh, 
And if you go to Robinsonville now, it's, it's regarded as one of the great dining experiences in the Delta <laughs> for the fried dill pickle and other They're things. They're amazing and worth it. So if you go do the Blues Trail, stop there for lunch or dinner. I've been there. <laughs> it's great. Five it's, stars. It's also where um, uh, the song Walking in Memphis. Right. Right. Uh, right. There was a piano player named Muriel, Muriel Wilkins who was a... Uh, Sunday school teacher from Helena, Arkansas. She used to play the piano there, and Mark Cohen uh, was inspired by her and, and used her, used and referenced her in the song "Walking to Memphis." Yeah. Great. So then, 1941 and 1942, Ellen Lomax records, uh, comes in and starts looking for musicians and records Sun House. He talked just briefly about those two. We've got just a few minutes left, so talk just briefly about those, if we can. <laughs> about those recording sessions briefly. Um, yeah, I, I played the track this morning about uh, with the, the Muddy Waters interview when Alan Lomax was talking to him, and and uh, Alan Lomax was trying to find out where Muddy Waters learned the song, and and uh, and Muddy says a boy named Sunhouse, and and Alan Lomax says who's that? Now, who's the who's now who's Sunhouse? And so that led. Right after he recorded Muddy Waters, he went to Robinsonville, or actually went to a Clack store and recorded Sun House in uh, 1941 and came back and recorded him <clears throat> again by himself in 1942 because probably that seemed, was more of the kind of music that Lomax was looking for. Lomax wasn't recording what was current on the blues scene very much. You know, he wasn't necessarily interested in and, the, and documented the contemporary blues of 1941. He was looking for the old folk songs, and he would he actually even suggest things to the artist to record. Yeah. So even though that's a wonderful archive of material he recorded, it's not really reflective maybe of what was actually being played in the Delta at the time. You know, I think that's shown in the difference between the 41 recording and the 42 recordings too, mm -hmm. because in Lomax's own book, which is, it's kind of confused. He, pushed both of those trips together into a single narrative and it's like it's a mishmash but um when he in his own book when he's you know he went down there john hammond told him go looking for people who knew robert johnson or who played like him that was his tip to what to do so that was how he was led to muddy and then muddy pointed him towards sun house and this kind of thing but when he talks to Sun House in his book, the first thing Sun House said was in 41 was let me get my boys together, implying he was already playing mm -hmm. in a small band mm -hmm. context. And I, I think you're, you're, Jim, I think you're, you're right that the next year, Lomax had definite ideas about what a blues should be, mm -hmm. and he didn't want anyone to be playing with Sun House. He wanted just him on record because mm -hmm. it was like, why we know he was playing with Willie Brown all through the 30s and then apparently also there's talk of like a trombone player would sit in sometimes and a drummer that was the way the music was going for sure by the late 30s look at like Bill Brunzi in mm -hmm. Chicago mm -hmm. you're starting to get combos and this kind of thing well Alan Lomax knew better <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was fun writing about him he was kind of a nut you know so <laughs> But there was some comic mileage in it. But I, I, I think you're right, Jim. That the next year he was like, no, no, I just want you, mm -hmm. you know. And then that was it. And then pretty much right after that he moves yeah, up to Yeah, the Rochester. next year. Well, I mean, you know, a huge event intervened between 40, August, September of 41 and 42, Pearl Harbor. And we entered the war, and it totally changed, you know, the Amer well, obviously life in America, but I mean, what jobs were available in the North changed dramatically. And that was certainly part of the reason, at least, that Sun moved to Rochester. There was also Daisy May Ketchum. <laughs> Daisy May Ketchum. <laughs> I didn't make that name up. <laughs> Caught him and made a move to Rochester. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, we're just about out of time, but I think we have a couple of minutes that we could take a couple of questions. So are there some questions? There's one right here. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering about uh, 
the role of technology in, in shaping the, for, the art form. So like what percentage of people in the Delta at that time actually had big trolls? You know, it just seemed like it was a poverty-stricken area, but you're hearing about Robert Johnson saying, well, you know, the, that he would get music from someone who was straight across in another area, maybe in Europe. So it's picking it up from records. Is that a records influencing? Uh, Rec records are influencing it. I mean, they were the the mid '30s was when the uh, jukebox came in, so. That was the place that a lot of people heard the records. And, but a, rec a Victrola was kind of a luxury. You know, at one time, even a radio was a luxury. You know? um, and a lot of times, um, records that, songs that we're familiar with because someone recorded them, may not have, that may not have been how they were transmitted among other singers. Uh, Tommy Johnson's a prime example, I think. He made some very influential songs, but almost every blues singer who was associated with him who, who started performing those songs learned them by seeing him in person, yeah. not by buying the records. Right. And so, you know, Sun House being a, you know, a prominent blues singer in that area, uh, people heard, you know, I, yeah. I don't know if Robert Johnson ever heard a Sun House record. I he, doubt it. Yeah, he, the, the records you know, he made in Grafton, they hardly sold right. because of the, the D Great Depression. And Paramount was bankrupt in 34. The 34 is the big year. Charlie Patton dies, son gets married, and Paramount goes bankrupt. So his, I, there's only one copy of Preaching the Blues, as far as I know, and ever been found. One copy of Mount. Yeah. yeah. So that tells you something about how they sold. I mean, how many copies of like Lonnie Johnson's stuff are there? A lot, or Leroy Carr, a lot. But people learned, Robert Johnson certainly learned the stuff directly from listening to him. So, but there were, you know, there were the, the jukeboxes and Victrola's, I mean, Muddy had like a jukebox in his, in his um, juke joint he ran. He was, had a still, he, you know, he was a bootlegger. And um, they, so Robert Johnson's the really good example. I mean, he was somebody who clearly learned things off of records. Like, he never met Lonnie Johnson, but he plays a song, Malted Milk, that is based on Lonnie Johnson's, one of his records. But so that, you know, it's, it's the period, the mid 30s, I'd say, is when it starts to shift right. away from simply people learning it directly to where there's radio. You know, and records, and certainly by the you know '40s, and then after the war, it's it's a completely different world. There's there's one question right here, and then I think that'll have to be our last question for this. Although I'm sure we'd love to take questions up here. Yeah. So we're um, talking about Mississippi, but I wondered if his life in Rochester uh, influenced uh, his blues that art form, because even though the geography was different, he came to Rochester and. Even here in our community at that point found uh, segregation, racism, limited job opportunities, limited housing. He was here for almost 30 years. <coughs> so I'm thinking that you know there were situations here that would cause one to look blues. Well, I mean, yeah, he he played for a while after he got here, but not the community was too small when he first arrived to support a real scene. I mean, there was I think I don't know. And the chapter that's about those years, you know, I had to fill it out with something. So you'd fill it out with statistics or something. And it was like, I think there were like 3,000 African Americans in Rochester when he arrived here. That's all. So it was like a, virtually a very small town. You're not going to have a, you know. He had a guitar for a while. Casella said that. And then he stopped. It grew slowly. It really didn't, the community really didn't get grow appreciably here until the late 50s, by which time he'd stopped playing years earlier. And he got a good job. He got a job with the railroad. He quickly went from this foundry to a job with the Pullman Company. And that was considered a very good job, you know, at the time. And so he had a good job, and he just, um, I, I don't, you know, it, it affected his music after he came back in the sense that he wrote about it. He made, he composed new, mu you know, new songs. Empire 
like Blue Express Blues mm -hmm. or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, Perline Louise McGee, who <laughs> was another apparently disastrous <laughs> fling. <laughs> you know? But um, so he incorporated it when he came back, you know. But um, it was definitely, you know, it was a tough road initially, I'm pretty sure. He was, you know. And, and I think we'll talk more, uh, especially tomorrow afternoon in the story sharing time, we'll talk more about Son's time here in Rochester um, and get some really great stories about, about his life and experiences here. So we yeah. definitely will touch on that. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Jenny. Jim, was it all?